Uh, today we're continuing our series in the book of Jonah. Say Jonah. Jonah, and if you haven't read the book of Jonah, I want to encourage you, go home today, take 20 minutes, and you can read the whole book. And you'll just feel like, man, I just read a whole book of the Bible. 20 minutes, all it's going to take. It's a phenomenal book. And what I love about this book that we're going to see today is it's, it's awesome. Do you know your Bible is amazing? There's some amazing stories in the Bible. And I talk to someone, and, and they say, uh, I, don't, I don't like reading my Bible. My Bible, you know, the Bible's just kind of boring. You know what I say to that? The Bible's not boring you're boring, okay? Well, the Bible has some amazing stories, and one of them is this book of Jonah. Jonah, the, the book of Jonah is known as a minor prophet. Jonah is a prophet. Uh, it's not a minor prophet because Jonah is minor or he is less than. It's just the size of the book. But we see Jonah, a prophet of God in the Old Testament, called to go to the city of Nineveh and preach against their wickedness. But as many of us know, Jonah, instead of going to Nineveh, which is 500 miles one way, he goes 2,000 miles the opposite way. Have you ever realized that it takes a lot more work to go against what God's telling us to do than to just follow the will of God? It's a lot easier to just do what God is speaking to you to do. And Jonah, he, he goes the opposite way. And what happens? A, a storm comes. And maybe you're here this morning and, and you just feel like, man, I feel like in my life I am just in this storm, like the waves are crashing, everything's going wrong, stuff at work, stuff at home. There's just this big storm. And lots of times when we get in a storm, I think we begin to blame God. God, why did you do this to me? God, why did you let this happen? Oh, and it's all blame on God. But what we see with Jonah and what we see with so many of us is that a storm in our life happens from our choices. It's, it's our decisions that get us into that storm that, that, yes, God allows to happen because he wants to get you redirected and back on the right path. So it, it's Jonah's fault he's in the storm, and, and the sailors and everyone, they're freaking out. And what does Jonah do? He owns up to it. He says, it is my fault. Throw me overboard. That's a pretty extreme way to respond to, it's my fault, throw me overboard. And lots of times we read uh, the Bible, we read the story of Jonah, and we just read like, oh, Jonah told him to throw him overboard. But while we all know the end of this story, how Jonah's gonna get swallowed by a fish, and then he's gonna be alive, Jonah had no idea. Jonah, in this moment, when he's on this ship, and, and everything's going crazy, there's this bad storm, and it's a bad storm. Turn your name and say, it's a bad storm. It's a bad storm. They're throwing cargo off the ship. That's their way of making it. It's a bad storm. Jonah thought in that moment, I would rather die than go tell the people of Nineveh about God. I would rather just die right now than to do that, which is such an extreme. And, and why does he not want to go to Nineveh? Well, I, I think it's important you understand that Nineveh, the people of Nineveh, are the most wicked, cruel people that there were. They were the, the terrorists of their day. They would go into a city and, and they would kill every single person, the men, the women, the children. One thing that, that I've studied is that they would then kill everyone, they would take the skulls and they would stack them up in piles outside of the town, outside of the city, so when anyone walked by, they knew they, they were here. These people, as they, would, as they would kill people, they would cut off their lips and keep the lips of the people they killed as a trophy. Turn your hand and say, Happy Mother's Day. These are very wicked people. And I don't think that Jonah necessarily was trying to avoid them just because he thought, well, if I go there, I'm gonna die. I'm sure he thought that. But obviously in this moment, he's okay dying. I think what really had him was they don't deserve you, God. They don't deserve you. I mean, think about today, if, if you were called to go over and you were to, God's like, I want you to go tell ISIS about their wickedness. You'd be like, they don't deserve it. They don't deserve it. I know I'm gonna die, but, but they don't deserve it. And that's where Jonah was. And because of his disobedience, the storm comes, they throw him overboard, and what happens? He gets swallowed by a giant, the Bible says, a huge fish. Can you just, like, I think sometimes we just, once again, we read this story and it's like, oh, he got swallowed by a fish. Okay, continue reading. No, he got swallowed by a fish. Can you imagine being Jonah and like, you get thrown overboard, you're in the water, and all of a sudden you're realizing, like, I'm not in the water anymore. Am I, is, is this heaven? What is this place? Like, where am I right now? The, the, how weird would that be? Like, when all of a sudden you realize, like, I think I'm in the belly of a fish. 
right? Like you would think you're going kind of crazy, but the smell, the, the lack of sight, like everything, it would be such an uncomfortable place to be. But what we see with Jonah is actually, this is the first time in our time of reading Jonah that he is in the will of God. That he's where God wanted him to be in the belly of the fish. And then all throughout chapter two, we see Jonah, he, he prays and he, he talks to God in this moment. And then to end chapter two, we see the fish vomits Jonah onto dry land. Bible's not boring, you're boring. The fish vomits him onto dry land. Can you just imagine, you're standing there fishing. You're just over there fishing. All of a sudden you see a big fish come up. You're like, wow, that's a, that's a huge fish. And it vomits a, a grown man onto dry land. Now, I could preach a whole message on this, and I started to in the first service, and it's just probably not the best thing for me to preach a message that I'm not supposed to preach this morning. But I wonder if those people who saw him get vomited went running back to Nineveh, and that was part of Nineveh and their huge revival. It's like, hey, whatever this dude says, he just got vomited from a fish, so listen to what he's saying. And then everybody knows who it is because he smells like fish, okay? How crazy, he gets vomited onto dry land by a fish. And he just wipes it off and off he goes into the city. And then after he gets vomited, this is where we're gonna be at this morning. Jonah chapter three, verse one. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Turn to your neighbor and say, a second time. A second time, turn to the neighbor you just ignored. Say, a second time. This morning, I wanna to preach to you for the next three and a half hours. A message called the God of Second Chances. Do you pray with me? God, we thank you that you're here, that you're in this place. We thank you for your word, your amazing word, that it's true. I pray that you would speak through me this morning, and that we'd be open to whatever it is you're calling us to this morning. In your name we pray, amen, amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad I got a second chance. I'm so glad I got a second chance. Turn to the neighbor on the other side and say, I'm so glad you got a second chance because you need a lot more than just a second chance. <laughs> All the moms said amen <laughs> on Mother's Day. So we're talking about the God of second chances and the first thing I want to look at this morning is this, is how does one get a second chance and the answer is this, through repentance. How do I get a second chance? It's through repentance. Maybe this morning as, as you walked in, you find yourself in a similar place as, as Jonah. You've, you've run from God, you've, you've disobeyed God, you, you know God's calling you to something and you're running from that calling. Maybe you're here and you find yourself week in and week out of this cycle of, I don't wanna continue doing that thing. I don't wanna be so angry. I don't wanna treat people that way. I don't wanna keep lying. I don't wanna keep looking at pornography. I don't wanna continue this addiction of alcohol. And you come in, you say, I want that to change, but you find yourself in this continual cycle. Can I tell you that the, the answer is repentance. What we see in the book of Jonah and all throughout the Bible is when someone gets a second chance, they get it by repenting. Look at Acts chapter uh, three. Verse 19, it says, repent then, turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Repent so that your sins may be wiped out and times of refreshing will come from the Lord. So what, what is repentance? Repentance uh, is extreme remorse or regret from doing something. You know, I, I've heard something said a lot of times of no regrets, live a life of no regrets, or maybe you've heard it said, YOLO, you only live once, do whatever feels good. But you know, as I've thought about this idea of no regrets, this really as Christians shouldn't be how we live our life. Because as we sin, as we disobey, as we go against what God's commanded us to do, I hope that it leads us to a place where we regret that, and as we regret that, it leads us to a place of repentance. It's repentance. You know, I, I, I think, Many times, we view repentance as, well, go ahead and bow your head and, and close your eyes, and if, if, you want repent, if you want to repent, just go ahead and raise your hand. You know what I've never read in my Bible? Bow your head, close your eyes, and raise your hand. 
Now, I'm not saying that that's not a good thing and, and that's wrong to do. I think it's, it's helpful to, to close our eyes as we pray and it's helpful to, to respond with raising a hand. I think all of that's good, but what I think is if that's as far as repentance is going, we're putting a Band-Aid on a broken bone. And I think lots of Christians get stuck in this place of not repentance, but I'm just gonna apologize. Repentance isn't just an apology to God. Repentance is turning from sin and turning to God. And, and we view repentance like, like my two-year-old son who just smacked his brother, says sorry, and then goes and does it again like five minutes later. It's like you didn't, you didn't repent from that. You're just sorry that you got caught doing it. And I think that's us with sin where we just say I'm sorry and then we go right back to it, but it takes us repenting, it takes us turning from sin and turning to God, it takes us owning up to what we did. I think lots of times we get stuck in this blame game. Well, I only did that because of that person or I was, I was hanging out with the wrong crowd. You weren't hanging out with the wrong crowd, you are the wrong crowd. Own up to it, right? We see it in Genesis with Adam. God says, Adam, did you eat the fruit that I told you not to eat? It wasn't, it, it was her God. It, it was her that, that you gave me. He plays. Eve, and then he blames God. Sometimes I think as we blame other people for our sin, I think God looks at us and is like, how dumb do you think I am? <laughs> just, just two days ago, I was at home with my boys and uh, my middle son, Wells, just likes to kind of hang out in his diaper. Like, doesn't really need clothes on. He's like, just the diaper's good to go. And as they were like playing, I, I started to realize like, it looks like he, he pooped in his diaper, right? Happy Mother's Day poopy diapers. It's got it's to work its way in there somehow. Looks like he pooped in his diaper. So I called him over. I said, Wells, did you poop? And I kind of felt his diaper and I could tell that in fact he did just poop. And he says, no. <laughs> Barrett did it. <laughs> I'm thinking, how dumb do you think I am that I would believe that your four-year-old brother who's been potty trained for years just pooped in his pants, <laughs> took it out of his pants, put it into your diaper, cleaned himself, and got away with it. But I think that's us with God so often, where we sin and we come up with some excuse and he's saying, how dumb do you think that I am? How dumb do you think? You think that I actually think that you aren't responsible for yourself. You are responsible. Turn around and say, you're responsible. You're responsible. And we need to learn to own up to what we did and have repentance. Not just an apology, but we turn away from sin and we turn to God. It's more than just an apology. It's turning to God, in, in Acts chapter two, we see that this is a good model for us as a church, and, and Jesus had just left, he ascended into heaven, he sent his Holy Spirit, they're in the upper room, and, and these, these people begin to speak in tongues. I want you to know that the Holy Spirit and the gift of, of tongues and, and the, the gifts that he has listed out, they're not just something we read about in the Bible, it's something for you, it's something that's for today. And they're, they're speaking in tongues, and, and it draws a crowd, and people begin asking questions like, what is going on? Peter, he, he preaches the gospel. Really, I think this is the first time the gospel is preached of Jesus. And look at how the people respond after he preaches. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? Peter re replied, repent, there it is again, be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's amazing, repent, be baptized, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not just an apology, it's, it's turning to God and it's taking the next steps. You know, I think sometimes we get stuck in this cycle of, of I make a mistake, I, I, I run from God, I, I'm in a storm that I caused on myself that, that God sent, so I pray like Jonah did, I get out of it, and then I go right back into it. You come in and, and you pray, God, forgive me of my sins, forgive me for doing this, and, and you leave and you go right back to it and it's a rough week because of it, you come back in, you pray, God forgive me of this, God help me with this, you go back out there and it's this continual cycle that we get ourselves stuck in. And I think as I've been praying about this and walking through this, I think the reason we get stuck in this cycle is we are not accessing the Holy Spirit. 
It's not a continual access of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes in and he changes everything. In our, in our youth series, we just got done this last week talking about the Holy Spirit in a series called Better because the Holy Spirit, Jesus says, I'm sending you someone better, which is kind of hard to imagine someone better than Jesus, but the Holy Spirit, I'm telling you, is even better. And what we see is, is this, in the Old Testament, there was a tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, there was, there was one place in the tabernacle that was the most holy place, the Holy of Holies. And in that spot in the tabernacle, is where the presence of God was. In order to get into the presence of God, there was a few things that had to happen. There was a blood sacrifice that had to happen, a sacrifice of an animal. You had to be washed in water and with oil. Three things that happened. And if you went into the most holy place, if you went into the presence of God without all three of these things, you know what would happen? You would literally die. You would, you would die. They would tie a rope around your ankle, and if you died, they would just pull you out. Now we know that Jesus came and he changed everything and he, since he has sent his Holy Spirit. But what we see is this, is the blood sacrifice for us today was Jesus on the cross. It's accepting that sacrifice. The water in the tabernacle now for us today is being baptized in water and the oil is the Holy Spirit. If you want to have the fullness of God, if you want to get out of that cycle of I'm disobeying God and I'm sinning, the, the blood of Jesus baptized in water and access the Holy Spirit daily. We have so many Christians walk around who are, who are dead Christians. Uh, I just feel dead spiritually. Uh, I, just, I just don't really feel like it today. I don't, I don't really feel like reading. I don't really feel like worshiping. I just, I just feel like I'm in this dry season. If you're in a dry season, if you find yourself in this place where you just kind of feel dead spiritually, where you're going through the motions, maybe you need to evaluate, am I accessing the Holy Spirit daily? Because it's those three things that give us the fullness of God. I don't know about you, but I want everything God has for me. I, I, I get sad when people come into church and, and they respond to Jesus saying, yes, I want him as Lord and Savior of my life. Now, I don't get sad about that. I get sad when it stays at that. Because that's like, that's your get out of hell free card, but I want you to know that there's so much more for you. The Holy Spirit has so much for you, and, and I, this isn't really in my notes, but I just feel like someone needs to hear that the Holy Spirit's for today, and he has amazing gifts for you. In youth the last couple weeks, we've been praying and we, we've seen these gifts happen. I've seen students receive words of wisdom, words of knowledge where they've shared it with another student and it was exactly what they needed to hear. We saw a leader come in with their leg, their ankle all wrapped up, couldn't walk on their ankle. Students prayed for them. Student, one student said, I had a vision in the shower this morning that someone got their foot or their leg healed. That student prayed for him. That leader took the bandage off and was jumping. He, he was able to walk on his ankle. That's a gift of the Holy Spirit. Healing is for today. Are you getting the fullness of God? Because if you're going into work with just your get out of, of hell free card and nothing else, I'm telling you, you're missing it. You're missing it. If you're stuck in that cycle of sin, if you're stuck in that cycle of disobedience, access the Holy Spirit. So first, how do I get a second chance? It's through repentance. The next question I wanna answer is, why does he give us a second chance? Because he wants to still use you. He wants to still use you. He wanted to still use Jonah. When you think about this, how amazing is that the God of all creation looks at you and says, I wanna use you. I wanna use you knowing your past, knowing what you've done. I wanna give you a second chance. I wanna give you a 20th, a 50th, a 100th chance. I want to use you. And as I think about people in the Bible who, who got a second chance, one person I think of is Peter. All right, Peter, if you know the story of Peter, the disciple Peter, he got quite the second chance. Peter's the one who, who tells Jesus, Jesus, I will never deny you. Even if all those other losers do, I will never do it, Jesus. Right? He's like very bold in that. Yet what do we know happens? Peter denies Jesus, not once, not twice. Three times he denies Jesus. Turn to your and say three times. Three times he denies Jesus. And look at what happens the last one in John chapter 18. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. 
Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire. Turn your neighbor and say a charcoal fire. Because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. Have you ever read the Bible and read like a, a part of the Bible that you're just like, that's a weird detail. Remember when I said the Bible's not lame, you're lame, it's not, it's not boring, you're boring? The Bible's amazing, I'm gonna show you this in just a minute. But what we see here is, is Peter, he denies Jesus for the third time, and he's around a charcoal fire. We know later Jesus goes on to be crucified, he's resurrected, he shows up to the disciples a couple times, and then look at what happens in John chapter 21. When they got out on land, so they were out on the boat, they were fishing, Jesus comes up, he says, throw your nets on the other side, right? They come back in. When they got on land, they saw a what? A charcoal fire in place with the fish laid out on it and bread. You know, thinking about this idea of a charcoal fire, I start to wonder, like, what's the significance of the charcoal fire? What's the significance of that detail? Have you ever been somewhere and like a smell wafts up and it takes you right back to a memory? You know what I'm talking about? Like for me, if, I'm, if I smell campfire, it takes me to like camping in Colorado with my wife. Or if I smell the smell of, of gasoline, it takes me to my grandpa's garage riding the four wheelers, right? If, if I smell hot dogs, it, it reminds me of a baseball game. Maybe there's smells for you that take you to one place, good or bad. But smells, they get us to our memories. And as I started looking at this, look at what I found on the internet, because the internet's true, okay? <laughs> this one is uh, hopefully doctor approved. As you smell something, it goes to your olfactory bulb, which goes to the cortex, the amygdala, and hippocampus, which is where your memories are stored. Dr. John, is that true? Dr. John said yes, it's doctor approved. <laughs> so as you smell something, it takes you to a memory. Which would lead me to believe that Peter, he denied Jesus the third time around a charcoal fire, and every time he smelled a charcoal fire after that moment, he was reminded, I denied Jesus three times. But can I tell you that we serve the God of second chances? And God, Jesus, he sees them out on the boat, he starts up a charcoal fire, he pulls him in, and he changes what that smell rem reminds him of. Look at what happens in John 21. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them, and so with the fish. This was now the how many times? Third time Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, around a charcoal fire, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, say a third time. Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So Peter, who, who smelled charcoal fire, reminded I denied Jesus three times. Now Jesus comes in, he gives it a second chance, where now whenever he smells a charcoal fire, he reminds himself, I was called by God to do this. I was called by God. We serve the God of second chances. And as I started looking at this, you know what I found? Peter denied Jesus how many times? Three times. Jesus shows up to them a third time. Jesus tells him how many times to feed his sheep? Three times. Jonah in the belly of the fish, three days, three nights. Matthew tells us that just as Jonah was in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights, so Jesus, son of man, will be buried in the earth for three days and three nights before he rises from the dead. As we read that story in Acts where the people, they responded and they wanted to say yes to Jesus, 3,000 were added to their number that day. The Trinity, God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, this number three is significant. And as I, as I was studying, I found that the number three in the Bible represents the number for completion. It's the number for completion. So here's what, I, as I was studying, what I felt led to tell you this morning is this, is that as God calls you to something, and I believe that it's not just a call that he has for a couple people in the room, God's calling every single one of you to something. 
Maybe it's to your workplace. Maybe it's to your family. Maybe it's to your neighborhood. Maybe it's to the school district. I felt heavy this morning as I was preparing that there's some people in here who feel like, man, our public schools are a mess. And you're sitting there saying, what a mess that is. Well, guess what? God's calling you to go into the public school and make a difference. Maybe you look at the government, say the government's a mess. God's calling you to take up a position in the government. Lots of times we're on the bus as, as passengers and no one's willing to be the bus driver. And what God told me to tell you this morning is this, is that if he calls you to something, he's gonna see it through to completion. He wants to use you. Again, God has a plan and a purpose for you. Would you stand with me all across this room? I believe that there's some people in this room this morning who are in a place where you need repentance. You need repentance. There's, there's a sin that you've been struggling with. Anger, addiction, bitterness. There, there's things that you're struggling with and it's led you to different places where those things are. And now today, I'm telling you, it's time that we no longer just apologize to God for that thing that we did but it's time that we repent and we turn away from that sin. We turn away from that lying. We turn away from that stealing and we turn to God. We access the Holy Spirit every single day. And some of you in the room, you're gonna to respond today because you are in a place of needing repentance. There's others in the room where you know, just like Jonah was called, you know that God has called you to something. And maybe it was you got called when you were a teenager, you got called when you were a kid. Maybe God said, I want you to go be a missionary to this country. Yeah, here you are hasn't happened yet and today you want to respond saying I want to say yes to that call I know God called me to my neighborhood I know God called me to this place I know God called me to my workplace and today you're saying I know he called me and today I'm no longer running but I'm saying yes I'm gonna follow whatever it is you want me to do God there's others in the room today or maybe you're just in this place of like I I, I feel pretty good in my faith I, I feel I feel all right I, I, I feel like I'm pretty good with with God, but today I want to encourage you to remind yourself and to show God, saying, God, I'm making myself available for whatever you want me to do. Whatever you want me to do, God, if you want me to go to that place, I'll go to that place. If you want me to do that thing, I'll do that thing. If you want me to talk to that person, I'll talk to that person. If you want me to sell that to give that money to missionaries on the other side of the world, I will do it. I am making myself available to you. And if you fall in one of those categories, which really all of us should, because all of us should be saying, I want to say yes to whatever God's telling me to do. I don't want to be like Jonah and be in a storm because of my disobedience. I want to say yes. And if that's you and you want to respond saying, it's time that I repent. It's time that I obey the calling. It's time that I say yes as an outward expression of an inward decision. I'm gonna invite you to come down when I get done praying. Just as an expression to God, say, God, I'm available. God, I'm here. You remind yourself, I'm making myself available for God to do whatever he wants me to do. I'm gonna pray and when I say amen, if that's you this morning and you're ready to respond in one of those ways, just saying, I'm available, I'm repenting, I'm obeying God. I'm gonna invite you to come forward and we're gonna spend some time just seeking after God. Some of you in the room, you're gonna be asking God, God, what are you calling me to? What are you speaking to me to do? Some of you are just gonna be in the, a moment of worship. I believe that in this moment, some of you are gonna make yourself available to the Holy Spirit for the first time. You're gonna receive the gift of the Holy Spirit this morning. There's something that God has for you this morning. God, we thank you that you're the God of second chances. We thank you that you love us too much to leave us where we're at. God, I pray for the people in the room this morning who are debating if they should respond or not because I, I don't want people to think this of me or I don't want people to think that of me. I pray that as, as we're seeking after you, that you are all that matters to us. We don't care what other people say. We don't care what other people do. I pray that for the people in the room who have disobeyed you, who have run from your calling, that today they would say yes to you. I pray for the people in the room who are just making themselves available, that you would speak clearly to them this morning for what you want them to do. We love you, we thank you, and here we pray, amen. If that's you and you're ready to respond to God today, the calling that he has in your life, would you respond in three, two, one, come on church, let's seek after him. I noticed that that line that says, I will not be shaken. I think lots of times we put the trust in ourselves, and you know what's always gonna happen when I put trust in myself in a tough situation? I'm not gonna be able to handle it. I can't take it, but when I look to God, hear me, responding to the call of God, I'm not saying it's easy to do. It's not I say yes to Jesus and everything's easy from here on out. I'm saying you say yes to Jesus and he's, he's gonna lead you through whatever's gonna come your way. 
but it takes you going beyond just a moment of, of I'm here at the church and I'm responding and I'm, I'm saying yes. It takes going beyond a moment of prayer and it takes you being obedient to what he's calling you to do. It's one thing to come forward. It's one thing to raise your hand and say, I say yes to God. It's another thing to, to actually prove it. A.W. Tozer it says this in a quote that I want to share with you this morning. Prayer is never an acceptable substitute for obedience. The sovereign Lord accepts no offering from his creatures that is not accompanied by obedience. To pray for a revival while ignoring or actually flouting the plain precept laid out in scripture is to waste a lot of words, get nothing for our trouble. Church, can I encourage you this morning? It's got to go beyond just prayer. Yes, prayer is good. Yes, prayer is necessary. But if all you do is, is pray, God, I, I pray for revival in our city. God, I pray for a change in this. And you are obedient to doing what God's telling you to do. If you're just sitting back and you're praying and you're watching the silence, he's telling you be obedient and step out and be that revival. Be that need that you're wanting to be met. Be obedient to what he's calling you to do. It's, it's about obedience. So how do we get a second chance? We repent. Why do we get a second chance? He wants to use us again. And we talked about how there's three and the number three is significant. The number three is the number for completion. So I felt like this morning I had to have a third point so my sermon could actually be complete. Otherwise it's not complete. And here's what I want to answer. What do we do when we get a second chance? The response, we praise him. We worship him because he's a good God, because he's a faithful God, because I don't deserve a second chance, yet he freely gives it to me. Yes. We worship him, and I think lots of times we come into this place and we refrain from worshiping because you know what just happened on the car right here. Say, nah, it, that just happened here and that messed with me. You know what happened during the week, and you're like, man, if I were to worship God, I see a lot of people get excited about a lot of things. Like sometimes I see some people in church and they're kind of just this like steady eddy where it's just like, yep, I'm singing a song. And, and that's, I know people worship in different ways. And then I see like you watch the Hawkeye game and you get really excited. You know what should get us really excited? Going from death to life. You know what should get us really excited? The fact that I made a mistake and God forgives me and that he's got a, still got a plan for me. Thank and you. coming in here, I think sometimes people are like, well, I feel like a hypocrite if I raise my hands because I'm a sinner. Look around, everyone's a sinner and you don't worship God because you're good. You worship God because he's good. Uh, there it is. It's not about you. Hallelujah. So can you lift your hands with me all across the room, church? And can you just begin to worship God, a faithful God, the God of holy, second chances holy. who's got something for you this morning. Give him all the praise, all the honor. Come on, church, sing your own song right now. Begin to lift up your voice. Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for us so that we could have a second chance to be that blood sacrifice for us. And today we say yes. And if that's you this morning and you wanna just say yes to Jesus, maybe it's the first time ever where you're saying, I wanna accept that sacrifice. Maybe it's, you've, got, you've gotten a little ways away and you're saying, I'm coming back to Jesus. If that's you this morning, you wanna say yes to Jesus, would you just raise your hand saying, that's me. I say yes to Jesus this morning. Yep, yep. Yeah, I see your hands, yeah. Thank you for these hands, God, that, that went up, that are going from death to life, the hands that are saying yes to you, to follow you, to obey you. And I pray that as followers of you, it go so much more than just an apology and, and back in the cycle, but we would repent, we would, we would turn to you and we would be obedient to what you are calling us to do. God, I thank you for each person in this room that represents change that's gonna happen in, in their family, in their city, and in their school, in their workplace. I pray we'd be obedient to your leading every single day, every single hour. We love you, we thank you. In your name we pray, amen. 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 Church, you got a second chance. Turn your name and say, you got a second chance. You got a second chance. So let's be obedient to what God's leading us to and let's change the world around us. Have a happy Mother's Day. Make sure to call your mom, text your mom, tell her happy Mother's Day. There's a photo booth out there. Stop and get a picture with your mom. On your way out, moms, grab a free coffee on us. Have a great day.